Our first speaker this morning is Professor uh, Michael Sieglist from the ETH in Zurich. He's full professor on consumer behavior. He concentrates on um, food and consumer behavior, and he's interested in communicating uncertainties, risk perception, acceptance of new technologies. And I'm very glad to um, introduce him with an interesting title of Uncertainties in Communicating Uncertainties. So thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity here to talk a little bit about some research we did about uh, uncertainties. So the whole thing started with uh, when EFSA decided that uh, there should be assessment also of uncertainties, not only point estimates. So basically the next question then was what are the implications now for communication? If we communicate to lay people, if we communicate to uh, risk managers, do we also need to address the uncertainties in this type of communication? Or will people be puzzled if in uh, the official reports there are uncertainties mentioned but not in reports to the other audiences? And that's why uh, guidance document has been uh, developed where some principles of communication of uncertainty have been described, and uh, one of the authors is the chair of this session here, Andy Hart, but you see many other people were involved in this whole uh, process here. When we started doing this work, we've realized that there is not too much work published about how uncertainty should be communicated. I mean, if you look at the literature, there is a lot of research about risk communication to lay people, there is a lot of about, uh, especially in the medical field, how you should communicate test results to patients, for example. But there is little research about how to communicate uncertainty to lay people. I'm not talking about uh, uh, communicating to experts. There are a lot of articles about this, of course. But if you look at how to easy communicate it, this is kind of a different thing. So then the question is, why should we communicate uncertainties? And you could say, well, you should do it from a normative point of view because you want to provide all information that may be important to people. So then you don't have to do research. It's just a normative question. Uh, but you may also say, well, maybe people make different decisions if they have some information about uncertainties associated with it. And then, of course, it's an empirical question whether uncertainty makes a difference or not. And again, there are not too many papers that really looked at this question. Another possible way or reason why people may like to communicate uncertainties, and this has also been expressed by some people at EFSA, that it may increase the level of trust. And I was always puzzled why you would take this for granted that uh, communicating uncertainties would increase the level of trust. But the reasoning of these people may have been like this because they've read a couple of papers in the literature. And then you hear people saying, well, you should be open. You should be transparent. Then it increases trust. But if I tell you that I want to steal your money, then I'm very open. Are you going to trust me? Probably not. So therefore, openness and uh, being transparent does not always increase the level of trust. So therefore, here the empirical question is, does it really increase trust? Does it not have an impact? Or may it even uh, uh, increase trust or whatever? But I'm coming back to this in a moment. Uh, related to uh, the impact on trust is the idea that a higher level of acceptance may be achieved if we are communicating uncertainties to lay people and other people who are looking at this type of information. I already mentioned there are some challenges involved with communicating uncertainties because most of the research we are aware of has focused on uh, decisions based or related to risk, a lot of research related to medical interventions, 
And in the case of FSAC, the situation was a little bit different from the published literature because uh, there you deal mostly with epistemic uncertainties, what we've heard yesterday. Uh, also, they usually deal with subjective probabilities. And I mean, as a statistician, you may say, well, everything is subjective probabilities. There is no such thing as objective probabilities, but explain this to lay people. I mean, that's maybe a completely different story, because if uh, you may tell lay people that uh, you're talking about subjective probabilities, they may react, why should I then perceive you as an expert if you just tell me what your gut feelings are? Uh, so therefore, this may be a challenge for communications. Uh, this also related to expect expert judgments if you tell them that uh, basically what you're telling them is just uh, what experts think could be uh, the reality. So I decided then to do some tests of our recommendations that we did. And I'm not sure whether all uh, of the co-authors are pleased with them going to show in a minute or so. Uh, because I was thinking, well, we made some recommendations based on the literature, based on our intuitive uh, feelings in a way. And now let's test at least one of what we've proposed. And I was unlucky or lucky, or, uh, I don't know how to frame it, because I broke my finger. And if you do not have one hand that's operating, you're very slow in typing. You cannot write, so you have to think. So therefore, I could do a lot of thinking instead of writing. And I developed here uh, some ideas about how to test some of the assumptions that we laid out in our uh, guidance document. So this is what you could read in, uh, as an example of how probability distributions should be communicated to uh, lay people. So here you see the example, experts estimated that on average in Europe 16 out of 100 slaughtered dairy cows are pregnant. Their assessment is based on limited data, but experts are 50% certain that the European average is between 9 and 27 and 98% certain that it is between two and 60. And I'm not going to talk about the content. I mean, just ignore the content. Don't be surprised that so many cows are uh, pregnant when they are slaughtered. That's not the point here. The point is here, how should we communicate this information here that people uh, can appreciate the uncertainty involved with the estimates. So if you look now at this, um, way of phrasing it, we may say, well, first of all, there are a lot of numbers in it. That's one point. The other point is, well, we have to make some decisions. We said, well, we provide the interval for 50 uh, percentage and 98 percentage. These are arbitrary decisions. Uh, does it make a difference whether we provide these intervals or when we would uh, use other intervals? What are the effects of such decisions? And these are basically empirical questions. So that's why in the first experiment we did the following thing. We said, well, why not provide one group just the point estimate? We would just tell them 16 out of 100 slaughter cows are pregnant. So this is basically the group with no uncertain information. The second group also received this point estimate, but in addition, they received only the 50 percentage interval where we are saying, well, between 9 and 27 out of 100 slaughter cows are pregnant, and the third group uh, received the 98 percentage interval to see whether the width of the interval makes a difference or not. We just did an internet survey. Uh, people were invited to participate, and uh, we had here a little bit more than 200 people who participated in this study. I should also say it has been in German, so therefore it's translated to German, uh, where we collected data. So here is the first question we ask. How severe do you assess the following situation to be? And there you see absolutely no difference between the three groups. So you have here uh, the mean values, you have here also the standard errors, and you see whether you look at the control group, only point estimate, whether you look at the 50 percentage group 
uh, or 50 percentage interval, confidence interval, or 98 percentage, it didn't make a difference to participants. We have the same severity. Now, what happens to the trust? How much trust do people have in these estimates by experts? Well, people who assumed that it would increase trust, they may be disappointed by seeing these numbers here. If we compare the two experimental groups to a planned comparison with the control group, then it's even significant different. And we would say, well, the experimental groups, they had lower trust in the estimates of the experts compared to the situation where it just provided a point estimate. Uh, the differences are not that large, but I think important here is to realize, first of all, that it's not going in the direction of increasing trust if you uh, uh, provide information about uncertainties. If something is going to happen, then it's the opposite. We had not that large of an effect and only a significant effect when you combined both experimental groups and compared it to control groups, that's why I said, well, it makes sense to replicate this uh, result in order to be sure what the effect on trust will be. So therefore, we did a second experiment. And here we used the exact information that you find in the guidance document. So the first group was the no uncertainty group, so therefore, they received just a point estimates. Experts of the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, estimated that on average in Europe, 16 out of 100 slaughtered dairy cows are pregnant. Then we had the uncertainty group, which received, in addition to what the no uncertainty group received, also uh, the information that the assessment is based on limited data, but that experts are 50% each certain that the European average is between 9 and uh, 27 dairy cows, and 98% certain that it's between 2 and 60 dairy cows. The third group, they received in addition to this information also a box plot, which should provide some graphical information about the distribution. You see here the German version of it, uh, where we provided here uh, the information that's basically the same information as you see in the text before, but here you have some uh, graphical display. Maybe this could be helpful for people to better understand what it's all about. We used uh, participants from an internet panel to measure uh, how they would react to it. We had this time a larger sample because we wanted to uh, replicate the relatively small effects, that's why I increased our sample size. We had uh, roughly 500 people, and participants were randomly assigned to one of the three conditions here. So either no uncertainty, uncertainty, or uncertainty and box plot condition here. So here we see the results in regard to severity. Again, no differences across the three groups. So the control group or people with uncertainty or uncertainty and box plot, they assessed the severity of the situation the same way. And we also asked them whether they think measures should be taken based on uh, these estimates and also there no differences across the three groups. So therefore, uh, if you look at this type of information, we can say, well, it doesn't seem to have an impact on how people react to the situation. It doesn't have an impact on their decision making. But again, the question is, does it have an impact on trust? And this time we had a clear significant uh, effect here in regard to the difference between control group and just uncertain information in numerical form. There you have a significant decrease in the level of trust. The group where we provided also the box plot, there is no significant differences to the two other groups. But again, if we hope to increase trust by providing uncertainty, then this graph is somehow disappointing because all you may achieve is that there is no difference. But if you are unlucky, then you have a decrease in the level of trust in the estimates. And again, that's not what has been intended. 
So another question, of course, is do people understand what we provide them? And it's not that easy uh, to come up with meaningful questions. Uh, if you just provide three uh, numbers, then it's very difficult to come up with meaningful uh, tests of the understanding. So therefore, we, we ask a uh, very simple question. We ask them, and if you're, maybe I should go back here that you see again the information. We ask them, uh, is the maximum of cows that are pregnant, is the maximum 60? Because we said, well, maybe they don't realize that we provide here a 90, 80 percentage interval, and this is not the maximum that can be observed. So therefore, we just ask, is 60 the maximum? And if we go to this slide here, we see here responses. Basically, it's 50-50. So 50 percentage came up with the right answer, 50 percentage with the wrong answer. And uh, you see here the questions out of 100 slaughtered dairy cows, maximal 60 dairy cows were pregnant, which uh, is false according to the data we uh, presented them. But nevertheless, 50% uh, roughly of the respondents came up with the wrong uh, answer to this simple question. We had the second question, uh, which was uh, uh, where the results were similarly, were also roughly 50% each were coming up with the right or the wrong answers. We also asked them a couple of questions about their evaluation of uncertainties, because we were thinking, well, maybe many people are not aware that science is associated with uh, uncertainty. And uh, a couple of years ago, Gerd Gieger and her colleagues, they did a study in which they asked people whether they think uh, the results of a mammography test, for example, whether it's deterministic or whether there is some probability uncertainty associated with it. And there are a clear majority of people, roughly 80 percent each day, were saying, well, this is not associated with uncertainty. This is deterministic. And he used a, a representative sample of the German population. And even if you ask them, do you think that an uh, astrology report is associated with uncertainty, 10 percent each were saying, no. If you have a, a professional report from an astrologer, then this must be uh, correct. There is no uncertainty involved with it. Now you can say these are 10% crazy people, so deduct them from all the others. But then you still have a reasonable amount of people who think that many of the tests are not associated with any uncertainties. And that's why we were thinking of questions that might uh, measure the ID that uncertainty may be, uh, for example, a trick of scientists to be on the safe side. So that they say, well, if we uh, provide uncertainty, then we are not wrong. So therefore, people may think, well, good scientists, they do not provide uncertainty. Bad scientists provide uncertainty because they play a dirty game with us. That's basically what we were trying here to measure with this type of questions. And you see here some of the questions. So the uh, first question, reliable experts provide their best estimates. Therefore, they do not need additionally indicate how certain or uncertain they are. And you see here, 50 percentage said, we agree with this statement. <coughs> or with the indication of uncertainties associated with their estimates, experts want to guard themselves in case they should be wrong. I mean, two thirds of people agree to this question. Or the third question, indication of uncertainties are used to lead people to believe that it's precise science. 45% agreed with this statement. Uh, information of uncertainty about estimates are of no help for me when making decisions. Roughly 50%. And finally, I like this one, how should one trust the estimates of experts if they indicate that their estimates are not 100% sure? And you see here 46% agreed with this statement. Then we have here, as you see, one quarter couldn't decide whether they really think it's true or not. But uh, people who would provide the answers we were hoping for, probably in this room, are a clear minority. This is roughly uh, 25 percentage or so on. So therefore, we clearly see here 
Uncertainty may not viewed as positively in lay people's mind as in our minds because they see this as an indication of bad signs. Let me wrap up some of the uh, insights uh, that we gained based on these uh, studies that we did. First of all, providing information about uncertainties did not have much of an impact on perceived severity. We've seen in both studies it didn't make a difference. Of course, we used just one possible uh, scenario. We just used uh, one possible case in which uncertainty is presented, so therefore it's difficult to say whether this holds true for all the recommendations we did in our report. However, given the clear data here, I would have some doubts whether it really has a huge impact on the perception of the hazard. We also realized that if it has one effect on the level of trust, then it's not what has been hoped for. It's in, in, in neither study it had a positive effect on trust. In both, it had a negative effect on, uh, on uh, trust. And given the last slide before, we shouldn't be surprised because people think uncertainty is just not a sign of good signs, and therefore they do not uh, evaluate it the same way we as scientists would evaluate it. We've also seen, and this could be a criticism, of course, of the way we did our study, only half of the participants were able to correctly answer a simple questions about the box plot. So you could say, well, maybe they were just not motivated enough to uh, fill out uh, the questions. I should say here that we uh, deleted all participants where we said, well, they have an unreasonable slow response time. Uh, so therefore, I still think the data clearly show that many people do not understand it. But it would be, of course, of interest to test this uh, hypothesis to test the proposed way of communicating uncertainties with uh, people in different settings where they are more motivated to invest some time, uh, maybe it will result in uh, different responses. I have some doubts based on past experience. I mean, we did uh, once a study about people's risk perception, and uh, in one group, they just received headlines of the risk. And they had to indicate how concerned they are about risk. And they could do it very quickly using their gut feelings. We had a second group. They read a whole booklet about the whole, all the hazards, half a page with uh, uh, numbers on it, with information and on so forth. Then they came to our lab and discussed for two hours. And then they filled it out again. And you know the correlation between the group who just rated the headlines and the group who invested half a day for doing the very same exam. It was uh, on the aggregated level, it was 0.9 the correlation. So therefore, probably not worth doing the effort again. You just give them headlines and you have what you want to have. Uh, but anyway, let's come back to the conclusions here. Uh, providing information of Uncertainties is by many people not perceived as a strength, but as a weakness. Uh, so therefore, we are kind of, and, and I'm not know at the moment how I should answer the question that I'm asking myself now. And the question is, should we now communicate uncertainties to lay people or not? And uh, there are pros and cons. We could say, well, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't increased trust, it may even decrease trust, so therefore uh, it may not have the desired effect. Uh, I guess what I would recommend here is that we still communicate it, but that we don't have too much expectations that it make a difference whether we communicate it or not. That's probably uh, the realistic assessment of the situation as it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting and somehow a bit frustrating uh, talk. The floor is open for questions. And just before we start, can I have, please ask you, you in the middle sitting there, just sort of 
you know, pull a bit more to the middle so the people who are standing there actually can have some seats. There is this general tendency in lecture halls only fill the outer seats, so the rest has to then sit on the, on the stairs or cannot sit. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, I didn't, I'll start with this one, I'll, I'll see you there. Yeah, yep, this one. I very much like the outcome of your broken finger, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> um, I have one question regarding the very last experiment that you showed about the different questions about lay people's feeling about scientists. To me, these all go into one direction, giving already a little bit of tendency. Did you also ask the um, complementary questions like a good scientist always gives mm -hmm, a range mm -hmm. of uncertainties? No, we asked, I mean, these were basically the same people uh, that participated in study two. So therefore, it was just kind of uh, an addition to this experiment, and we formulated a couple of questions. So therefore, this is not, not an experiment. We were just interested how people react to it. I fully agree with you that they were all formulated in the same direction. It could be worth uh, formulating in different uh, uh, ways, uh, certainly something uh, one should be doing in the future. Absolutely, thank you. Next one, yeah. Uh, I, I very much like this experiment. I, I think it is uh, the way people are behaving. But uh, there is one thing, and these intervals, uh, it struck me as very wide. And that is sort of normal, that when you ask people what is the 50% interval or what is the 91% interval, then they, they uh, produce two narrow intervals. So I wonder whether some of your result is due to the fact mm -hmm. that they were surprised by this uncertainty. The uncertainty was right, bigger right, than they yeah. thought it would be. Uh, up, it's a very good question. Uh, I mean, what we did here is we just wanted to use realistic data. So that's why we used the data from an EFSA report. Uh, and then we used an example where we thought that uh, there are not too many technical terms because people can somehow understand what the slaughtered cow is and what the pregnant slaughtered cow is. So therefore, we were a little bit restricted. But I think it would be interesting, fully agree with you, to change kind of the width of uh, the interval in future studies. One could use the very same scenarios, but change it and then say, well, in some instances we had the realistic intervals, in others we have not, and then uh, test whether people react differently. So therefore, I, I absolutely think it uh, would be valuable for uh, future research. But of course, then the question is if we find such differences, would then the recommendation be if you have very narrow intervals, then communicate it. If you have larger intervals, do not communicate it. So therefore, the implication is then, even though I find it from a psychological perspective uh, interesting, the question for me is what would the, uh, uh, the practical consequences be? Okay. Short of time, I'll, I are, there are two, these two questions, this lady over there and down there, can you just Ask quickly your question, oh, uh, and we have this to... Is not, this is not a question, it's an answer. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, so we have... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, because we're going to run into problems with the next speaker if he doesn't have enough time. Okay. Uh, can we just uh, report it to the, either to the coffee break or the panel discussion later on? Hello? No, first over there and then... Okay. <laughs> no, so, Michael, thanks a lot for this uh, results. Very interesting. Caroline, where are you? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so one thing which you research also answered is that there were in the past, whenever we discussed uncertainty, wherever we presented, there was also this concern that we would increase the risk perception. So you, the results show that it, it doesn't appear to do that. So that for me is also something positive here to take home. On the one other aspect, I'm yeah, and this probably needs more discussion, is trustworthiness. I mean, we talk about trust, but we have seen also from the presentation of uh, David Spiegelhalt at the EFSA conference when the trustworthiness is a little bit more complex than just asking the people, layman's people, a simple question whether this is trustful or not. I mean, how can you test trustworthiness? This takes time. 
No. I, I, I mean, I can quickly tell you whether I trust my medical doctor or not. I do not have to do research. I just tell you immediately I trust or I do not trust him. And I'm sure you do the same thing. So therefore, we are very good in making quick decisions and uh, they are sometimes wrong, of course. But uh, more often than not, they are right. So therefore, I, I, I would disagree that uh, people have to do elaborate uh, thinking and studies in order to s decide whether they will trust uh, a person or not, or an, an, an estimate or not. I think people are very good in coming up uh, with uh, quick answers to this. But this may be, of course, different between experts and lay people because they may use different cues to indicate their trustworthiness. One last comment, just before, because what I... What Can I we would, uh, yeah, yeah. carry it over to the break, please? <laughs> because otherwise... We're going to be rushed for, for the... Hold it. Didn't compare it to the correct control group. You didn't compare it to the group, but you asked, this is the answer, there is uncertainty, but we choose to not uh, communicate it to you. But you, communicate, you compare it to the group, but you said, this is the answer, and nothing else. So it's the same level of uncertainty in all these three cases. But, but you're comparing to the case where the, the audience is not informed that there are uncertainty that we are hiding to you. So you, you have to compare it to the right control group to, to come up with that conclusion. Otherwise, this evidence, this will be evidence against communicating uncertainty, against quantifying uncertainty and describing it in assessments. It's a really crucial point. Uh, I'm not sure whether I, whether, I, whether I understand what you're trying to say. I mean, you're really trying to say that we should have had a control group where we said, we provide point estimates, we have a lot of uncertainty, but we do not communicate it to you. But that's, but that's not what we are interested in. The interest, because EFSA didn't communicate this way in the past, they didn't say, uh, this is the estimate and there is a lot of uncertainty, don't care about this point estimate because it's of no value. I mean, of course, people would say, we do not trust you. But that's not what we were interested in. We were interested in whether uh, the old way how EFSA communicated, providing point estimates as valid assessment of the situation, whether this is different from the new area where you provide uncertainty with the point estimates. That's what we were interested in. So therefore, you could run this study, but I wouldn't know why you would like to run such a study.